Welcome to the Sea Trade Maritime podcast, and you're listening to Marcus Hand, editor of Sea Trade Maritime News. In this latest episode, we'll be focusing on the US West Coast ports and the tentative agreement that has been reached between the International Longshore and Warehouse Union and the Pacific Maritime Association for dock workers, and it's a six year new contract. And that has taken some 30 months of increasingly fraught negotiations to come to that tentative agreement. Joining us to discuss what happens next is Peter Sand, Chief Analyst with Zanetta. Before we delve into today's topic, Peter, could you briefly introduce yourself and Zanetta and why this situation with US West Coast ports has been of such interest to you and your organization? Absolutely, Marcus. Uh, good of you to get in touch because I think this is a pressing area of interest for all with vested interest in global supply chains, including, of course, also essential for Sineta, our key customers, the world's largest shippers, those with very complex supply chains, those that need always the best possible intelligence to make smart decision making, right? So, in essence, that's what we are all about at Sineta. We are the world's leading benchmarking platform for ocean freight and air freight rates. Uh, we also do market intelligence, and that's basically what this is all about, trying to untangle all the knowns and unknowns from each other. Try also to put words to the unknown unknowns, because there is always something coming next. I mean, this has been troubling us for some 13 months and even in the lead up to that. So so basically since uh, dawn of 2022, it's been a, an issue for shippers to handle, a risk for them to manage. And I think right now when we look at a tentative agreement, we still know no details about that. We still also know that it's subject to ratification. So I think it's important to still be aware of where are we right now what kind of, say, obstacles do we need to clear out before we can once again see cargo flowing in the vital supply chains in and out of the key and essential U.S. West Coast ports? So I think, in essence, we all need to know more. And while operating in this vacuum, of course, we need to apply our brains to see through the mist and come up with qualified guesses on how long will it take to, uh, to, to unwind the problems that we have right here, right now, and when will we get through it? Fingers crossed, with a signed agreement. Thanks, Peter. Well, I think what I'm hoping you can help our listeners with is actually seeing through some of that mist with some of those unknowns that you mentioned there. As you say, we don't know the details of this tentative agreement between the ILWU and the PMA. But perhaps you could explain why, therefore, you know, this tentative agreement is so significant to shippers, shipping shippers and the supply chain, and that it has at least finally got to this stage. In all essence, this is the main gateway for Asian imports into North America and to US uh, mostly, of course. And even though the trend have been very clear for many years, not only due to the recurring disruptions from the uh, seven year uh, repeating uh, discussions that always bring obstacles around, but we right now see, well, uh, development where some two thirds of all Asian imports uh, were getting into America via the US West Coast ports. And soon we will see only half of that. Shivers are literally fed up with this. Uh, I think also to some extent carriers are, even though they probably also could benefit from uh, more disruptions uh, around in the current uh, freight market environment, uh, because I think it's, it's no hidden secret that the uh, more poorly you can deploy uh, nominal fleet into the market, the higher the rates spot as well as long term. Uh, so, so there are always, say, contradicting interests in a, in a crisis like this. But I think if we nail down just the two weeks that have recently passed, where things really soured in the negotiating room, I think they, they were sitting somewhere in, in, in San Francisco dealing this. 
but we have definitely seen also the impact right on uh, on the waterfront of uh, U.S. West Coast ports, where we had approximately 50 ships uh, waiting to, uh, to to call two weeks ago, and we right now see approximately 75. So that's an increase of 50 percent in only two weeks, and this is just an average size ship uh, calling a U.S. West Coast port with around 8,000 TUs, uh, at least of, of, of nominal capacity. So with railways also not accepting bookings for U.S. exports, this has really hurt shippers, exporters, as well as importers. And it comes on top of all the obstacles that, uh, that they have seen from uh, red tagging equipment, from going slow uh, either way. Uh, we have seen demand drop on the U.S. West Coast uh, ports uh, by 1 million TEUs in the first four months of this year. Of course, not only due to the labor disruptions, but also due to general demand really tanking down by approximately 25% when you compare the first four months of this year to that of last year. So I think a lot of things can be taken away from this. Shippers, of course, brace themselves now also for an agreement that will not be ratified in the end. It was only last week we saw ILWU Canada saying with a massive majority that they could go on strike uh, as early as 23 June. So uh, so I think it's fair to say that this is by no means a done deal. Everyone in the supply chains connecting uh, the dots in the US West Coast should be very much aware of this, that, that, that we're not out of the bushes yet. Uh, we can only expect things to improve from here, but they should still not just call it a done deal. They should still put up, say, any extra emergency plans. And, and I uh, do not need to go further south than, uh, than the Panama Canal to see that that's a bad option to choose as an alternative right now for, uh, for shippers into the U.S. West Coast. But then again, it, it may be the first option for, uh, for many still to consider. So you still see... A fair amount of risk here. Um, you mentioned there the situation in Canada with the vote in favor of striking Canadian ports if a deal is not reached there. And those talks had broken down. You know, the water issues in Panama Canal. And also, I mean, how much chance is there that this tentative deal might not go through? I think we have a we have a democratic president in the US, so so one that should, in theory at least, favor the interest of ILWU, uh, the dock workers. So the fact that, that this tentative deal came around very quickly, they uh, deployed a little bit of political power from sending the acting Secretary, Secretary General of the Department of Labor, right, to bring the parties closer together. I still see it as, as, as a risk of a certain size because the parties were really struggling to land this. As, as alluded to in the opening, this was just about to be either very, very sour, coming to a complete stop with perhaps a real closure for weeks and months. And now we got a tentative deal. So I still think there's a lot of work to be done from the ILWU local members to make sure that their parties and their local units also vote in favor of this. I, I, I see lower risk to, to the PMA uh, not agreeing to this, even though we do not know the details, just from the way that I think about it, it seems to be more in the interest uh, of the PMA to, to get this done than, uh, than ILWU, because they seem to have really been in the trenches on this for uh, for a long time. So uh, so always consider your options, uh, be it Panama Canal, be it uh, Suez uh, Corridor for, for US West Coast bound uh, products, as always with global supply chains and always with the supply chains going through uh, the notoriously tricky U.S. West Coast. Be prepared for the worst and hope for the best. Okay, that's some good advice there. So clearly there are still some obstacles to overcome. Now, this sort of period we've had these 30 months and, you know, a particular situation you described in more recent weeks, uh, you know, we've had this lengthy period of uncertainty and disruption more recently. And this came on the back of the massive supply chain issues we saw in 2021 as well. You know, how much damage has this done to US West Coast ports? Sineda data is all about spot rates and long-term rates. And then, of course, a lot of other intelligence on top of that, you know, like deployed capacity, reliability, and the likes of that. But if I may just introduce what kind of damage 
could have come out of this in relation to the freight rates. It's, of course, the fact that shippers have definitely not been in a rush to sign long-term service contract agreements with the essential carriers through this vital corridor. So I think it's fair to assume that if we get a ratification, hopefully also we will see shippers once again happily signing long-term contracts. But we're not really seeing a rush. We're not really seeing a lift of long-term contract rates due to this, say, go-slow action or this, you can call it the disruptions, the recurring disruptions that we've seen on the U.S. West Coast. We saw spot rates, the level spot rates from the XSIC going up in the early week of June as this was really getting tense. But we've also seen some easing uh, this week. So uh, so I was thinking, in essence, there's always some temperature and some sentiment to take away from the spot market rates. But in essence, a lot of the carriers just need that long-term contract volume to be signed right here, right now, so they can plan ahead. Carriers are all about optimizing that global network of services. And if they cannot rely on the essential big volume service contracts into a key destination like the U.S. West Coast, they are in trouble. Uh, so I think for, for all parties, for, for the shippers, but certainly also for the carriers, something of a quiet period now, potentially at least for the next five years before negotiations start for, for, for the next contract, they will enjoy that breather. They will still see volumes flowing through the U.S. West Coast port. But since this has also been going on for 13 months, and then some, as I alluded to, it's it's basically a year and a half. And shippers have found new ways. They have found new corridors to uh, to getting their goods in to where customers need it, to where warehouses are placed. And they have worked through not only the obstacles during the COVID years where we saw 125 ships being anchored outside the essential ports, mostly uh, the San Pedro Bay complex. So they have found new ways. So obviously... They will fight to get their volumes back in the ports on the U.S. West Coast, but it's a little bit against the tide. I mean, they have pushed volumes through the U.S. East Coast ports now. They have dealt with that very well. They have actually scaled up their capacity over the past decade to actually handle a situation like this one. They know it would come around with a, with a certain certainty, with negotiations being in trouble every single time around. And they have just been scaling up, getting those cranes in, uh, building those bigger terminals and ports, and yet they were overwhelmed too. But at least they proved the point that they can bring in cargo, perhaps even uh, to, a, to a smarter way than, uh, than the U.S. West Coast ports uh, have, have done so in the past. So, uh, so I see a trend, especially the Asian goods have, have trended down from being only U.S. West Coast to definitely being very much also U.S. East Coast and U.S. Gulf Coast. So you've got that situation where you know, shippers have rerouted their shipments. You've got the infrastructure on the U.S. East Coast today. I've seen some very sort of positive messages from the likes of Gene Soroka, the executive director of the Port of Los Angeles, about winning business back. But how easy or how difficult is it going to be to persuade the shipping lines and the customers, the shippers, to bring those services back? I think the one thing that I will look out for when eventually the details of this agreement will get out in the open is to what extent the PMA were successful in promoting and bringing more automation around. I think in essence that is inevitable to be around to a larger scale than what we see right now because it also builds, you can say, resilience in a port complex like this. The more you have in terms of automated terminals. I know that no automated terminals are fully autonomous. That's not what it's all about, but it's about making sure that cargo can flow in and out of the port as smooth as possible. Let alone, of course, also having the right, uh, say, gate in and gate out opening terms, having the right amount of uh, of trucks available and and truckers getting in and out also 24 seven to a lot of people, it was, Perhaps a little bit mind blowing to hear that during the COVID years, it all of a sudden occurred to the average Joe that movements were not made 24 uh, 7. We could still move 
boxes out of the port complexes uh, in the middle of the night if need be, but the agreements did not uh, open up for it. So I think there's still vast amounts of improvements inside the ports as well as the connectivity between the port and the hinterland, very critical as well. So, so I think the likes of Gene Siroca and the likes of Mario Cordero will definitely be out now there trumpeting the horn saying that this deal is as good as it gets so bring back your cargo bring back your volume asap we will handle it to an even better standard than uh, than what we have ever done time will tell if they're capable of doing that uh, but at least that is what we will hear from uh, from those two guys and the rest of the ports of course on the us west coast in the coming weeks and months so a lot of it's actually going to hinge on what's in this agreement, but none of us actually know what's in it yet, and how much that enables the ports to go forward with automation and become more efficient, which has been a long-standing problem for those key gateway terminals. I think also not only bringing a much-needed update to all the port facilities, uh, realizing also that, that, that automation is not necessarily only faster. Uh, in many instances, a uh, skilled crane operator is, is faster than, than any automated crane uh, can be. But I think it brings that certain amount of resilience and certainty around. And, and if we are also just uh, paying a little bit of attention to what kind of date are we recording at? We're recording mid-June. And normally, normally, Q3 would bring around a record number of boxes into the US West Coast port because a traditional season is just around the corner. I think that was perhaps also something that the two parties could agree on when closing this tentative agreement. They simply had to make it to whatever peak season come around. Uh, in Seneta, we do not expect a massive flow of cargo. Simply, uh, the market is not there. The shippers do not need extra inventories on top of what they already got. But from a port perspective, I think they, they, they better be prepared for, for peak season in whichever form it could come around. Because if they lost out on successive peak seasons, they perhaps would lose even more essential volumes than they already have done in the past 18 months with redirecting cargo through Vancouver, through Manzanillo, through uh, Virginia, or New York, New Jersey. So essentially, make sure that, that you're prepared. And I think it's game on. You need to, uh, to deliver from a port perspective, uh, the service and uh, exceed the expectations of the service levels required and ask for by the shippers. Nothing short of that will be satisfactory in order to see, okay, now we are moving into the next phase. Now we're moving into a much more quiet and much more steady level of goods flowing into US West Coast ports. So, yes, that peak season is going to, or whatever form it takes, is going to be very interesting to watch. And I'm sure that uh, yourselves at Sonetta will be putting out uh, lots of data about that, which I'm sure we'll also be writing about on Sea Trade Maritime News. Now, yeah, you know, this is a tentative agreement, but hopefully this situation has or will be resolved on the US West Coast and things will start to go back to normal. Just to round this up, are there other sort of key issues with the supply chain uh, in the next few months coming up that shippers should be watching for? I think if we uh, if we stick to uh, to the Americas, uh, for sure, uh, the low water level that has made draft restrictions tighter in the Panama Canal is one thing to watch out for. I think the uh, the potential of this being of huge disruption for, uh, for shippers uh, via that corridor is high. It may just be that uh, the second half of 2023 will not be, say, hugely damaging. But if we do not get the water expected into the watershed in the second half of this year, we will really get into a challenging 2024. Be aware that, well, it's time for, for, for another round of El Nino, meaning that we may not get what we need in terms of, of water into the shed. So, so I think it's one of the short-term as well as long-term disruptors of supply chains, at least for, for North American shippers, uh, the water level in, in Panama. So watch out for, for that as, as it evolves. And if there's another uh, aspect of, uh, of the global markets that I would love to, to hint to as well positively, I think what we're seeing now with the American Central Bank not hiking interest rates following 10 successive hikes, that's positive. Inflation is coming down. It's potentially 
well, at least relatively, this is an improvement from a, from a bad situation. But we do not need to look further than, than, than China to see also that they are struggling in, in, in China. And that will, of course, also impact the wider Asian region, uh, into Asian market being the biggest of them all, China naturally being the driver. And I think those are some of the factors that I would watch out for in terms of what comes next in the scale of not only relocation, that's that's the really long game, but more in the, in, in the shorter term. Uh, watch out for, uh, for for the ability of China to, to respond to whatever demand is coming from North Europe in particular, because that have surprised on the upside into North Europe in the last couple of, of months. So uh, so watch out for the economics more than, than anything. Uh, I think it's fair to say that the rest of this year will prove to be different than the second half of 2022, where we saw a very high market in Q3 and a very low market in Q4. Expect more stability, I would say, uh, for the second half. But still, of course, check out the volatility in the spot freight rates that are being offered uh, by the freight forwarders and the carriers to the world's shippers. And there's no better place to watch out for that than on the Sonata platform. Great. Thank you, Peter. Those are, are really good things for everyone to be aware of and to watch out for, including ourselves uh, on Trade Maritime News. I'd like to thank you so much for taking the time to talk to our listeners today. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. And that's all we've got time for on this episode of the Sea Trade Maritime podcast. Thank you for listening. And please make sure you subscribe on the app of your choice to make sure you never miss an episode. Until the next episode of the Sea Trade Maritime podcast, stay safe. <laughs>